where are the markets headed and how should you trade the S&P, NASDAQ, and whatever other indices we're following right now? Well, there is no one better to answer this question than a trader himself. Anmol Singh joins us today. He is the founder of Live Traders. Anmol, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, David. Let's talk about the broad markets first and we'll get into specific trades that you like and also don't like. So we've seen a bit of volatility in the past couple of weeks, actually. The S&P 500 has topped in early September. So tell us about that. What happened there? Um, obviously, there's a lot of like, you know, fears regarding what's happening in China. And then there's a lot of uh, different fears like Fed tapering and what really happens. I mean, Michael Burry had a report as well for every transaction that goes that pushes the market higher when the Fed starts to unwind, usually would lead for the prices to come back down. Now, technically, I mean, we've already been extended. Even last time, I think I was on Kitco, I was talking about might be the time to start locking in profits rather than establishing positions. And that's where we're at right now. I mean, the trend line has clearly broken, uh, but the trend hasn't broken. So as you can see here, this is the chart of the S&P 500. Spiders, every time we go down, we hold this green line, which is a 50 simple moving average. Every time we keep holding it and keep bouncing, but this time we were not able to. Right? We actually broke it with a gap down. We got a little bounce. And what was interesting is that in this bounce, everybody suddenly turned bullish again. They're like, okay, markets are going back to all-time highs. Let's start putting those positions back on. And that's what, as my contrarian view was like, if everybody's thinking the market's literally going all the way back up, there might not be a time. So I started establishing positions as the market rallied back into those moving averages. Uh, that was like the backside of a trend line technically. Uh, so we started taking short positions. Uh, today, the market has gapped down, which actually has made it really easy as a technical trader, uh, because th the fact of the matter is, if today we close you know, red, like are we, we are right now, if we get back above it, we're going back to all-time highs, right? And if we get a follow-through below this recent low that we had under 428 on the spiders, I think we're going all the way back down to test the 200-period moving average around this uh, $409 area. So technically, I mean, I think markets are very due for a pullback. But it's nothing to be scared about. It's not like the market's ending or, you know, we're really coming down hard. It's that, hey, profit taking has to happen, right? And that's healthy. That's healthy for the markets. If you look at this monthly run we've had, we're definitely due for a pullback. And that, I think that would be a Bible pullback when we eventually do pull back uh, to the 21 moving average around 371 on the spider. I think that's where we're headed. Well, Emma, some people might say there's a bit of... Uh, you know, there's a bit of confusion right now as to where the markets are headed. Maybe there's not as much clarity as some traders would like. So isn't it better just to stay in the sidelines, wait for momentum to really establish before getting, getting back in? Definitely. I think if you took profits on this rally up, up and now you're looking to get back in, you're looking for a re-entry point, it's always better to wait. Wait for some clarity, wait for some strength. Because the problem is a lot of people are fully invested in this market that doesn't leave a lot of gunpowder, so to speak. For more buying to come in and to stocks for continuing to rally. I think this is what, what you're seeing right now is people having you know, generational gains uh, locking in their profits. So I think if you're looking to get back in, definitely wait. My rule of thumb is pretty simple. It's like, hey, market drops 10% from the all-time highs. You know, Start putting your positions back on. Market goes down 20%. Now you start getting in full, but definitely not the time to be buying at the moment, in my opinion. Okay. So S&P 500 up or down by the end of the year, do you think? Uh, down. Down? Okay. Now, yeah. Emma, so you, you, you analyze stocks as well. So we'll be talking about some, some trades that you like. How do you feel overall about the fundamentals of the market? Not just sentiment, not just the technicals, but the fundamentals backing up the stock prices we've seen this year. Do you think earnings make sense? Do you think valuations make sense? Do you think a re the, the, the recovery in the economy is uh, reflected in these prices? What do you think? I think valuations are definitely high, but there's a certain sectors that where valuations are high and there's certain sectors where there's still opportunity, sectors that have been neglected for a while, so to speak. But the valuations are definitely high. I mean, I do a lot of like private equity investments as well, uh, have a lot of angel investments in startup companies. And even in the deal flow that we're seeing in private companies, the valuations are just crazy. Everybody wants the top dollar for their company, but I think it's a way too optimistic at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty right now, fundamentally. And uh, I don't think those uh, valuations really justify where the stock prices are at at the moment. So let's tie back, uh, tie what you just said back into your forecast for the S&P 500 down by the end of the year. Why do you think will fall down from current levels? I think uh, for the reasons that we were just talking about is like there, a lot of people are fully invested. And for things to go back up, there needs to be additional buying coming in. So now that the Fed is also tapering and people usually are either fully invested and they're looking to lock in profits. 
there's not a lot of additional interest or buying coming in. But what I have noticed is that there's buying coming in on those smaller cap stocks that have been neglected for a long time. That's where volume is coming That's in it. and there's still some potential. Uh, but as it relates to uh, big cap, I think uh, I think it's definitely the time to wait technically as well. I mean, you know, look at technically the chart, the monthly chart. Look at this one. Every time we get too much extended, we usually get a snapback like we've always have gotten. This time we haven't got the snapback rally, uh, snapback pullback for a really long time. So that's what makes me think we're going to pull back here and then we're going to probably go back up. So this is the time around 370, on the S&P. If you do get a pullback towards the end of the year, that would be the time I would uh, look to get back into the markets. I mean, what, what, where you're drawing the arrow right now, that, that looks like a, or the cross here rather, that looks like a pretty significant pullback. Some people were talking about, you know, potentially a market crash, a bear, another bear market in the order of maybe 20 to 30 percent. Um, is that is that possible, or are you talking about a correction in the order of maybe just single digits, and and then we'll see a you know nice healthy pullback and then a recovery from there? What's your take? Right. So I, I think we're definitely. I don't think we're going to crash. So there's a difference between crashes and bear markets that people always confuse. A crash is what happened. Let's in coronavirus, where you quickly go down and like a bungee cord, you snap back right up. That's a crash, right? A bear market is where you have a lengthy period of downtrending, similar to if you go all the way back in, let's say, 2000. You saw this was three years of pullback, three years of decline, right? You go back here. This was three to four years of decline. So that's a bear market, and a crash would be when you get a quick snapback drop. So I think we're definitely not going to get a crash, but we are going to get like a lengthy, I think, period of pulling back. I think we're going to enter a, a bear market. So I do think uh, 20 30% pullback is not really unreasonable to ask for. But over an extended period of time, not just you know in a matter of days, right? right? Yeah, over an extended period of time. Interesting. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about your positioning in just a minute. Let's go back to small caps. You mentioned small caps, so yeah, it's true. The uh, Russell two thousand somehow has not moved up at all uh, since the start of the year. Unlike the large caps, why is that? Why why have the small caps lagged this year? I think what you're seeing in the small cap stocks is a lot of trader activity, is what I call it. Not a lot of investor activity. So investor activity would be that that's you know sustain the prices higher. What we're seeing is trader activity, which basically means those stocks that have been beaten down, those small cap stocks, they usually get a nice little healthy bounce, which could be 20, 30, 50 percent bounce, but you're seeing profit taking there, and the stocks usually come right back down. So the sector as a whole is not really able to lead the market because there's profit taking happening along the way. So I think this is a trader's market more than an investor's market at the moment. For traders, this is a great market. I mean, I love it. Uh, there's a lot of volatility increasing back again, but I don't think this is an investor's market right now. I think investors really need to be cautious and not jump into buying every little dip because that's the contrarian view, right? Market has conditioned, the Fed, the market has conditioned traders to buy every dip because, well, guess what? We go back up. It's like a running joke on Twitter, right? When Jerome Powell wakes up tonight around 2 p.m. or something, stock markets will go back up again and close green. Uh, but I think people have been conditioned to buy every single dip until it doesn't work. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to be caught off guard in this market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jerome Powell, social media influencer for finance of the year. Definitely. He, he wins that award any day. So let's talk about, uh, well, the VIX. I and mean, the VIX is still relatively low compared to historic levels. Is that something you watch for as a trader? Yeah, I, I do watch uh, the VIX as a trader. I do think that it's a healthy thing to have certain call options on VIX. If you have a long-term portfolio that has a lot of you know, money still invested into it. I think it's a good position now to start getting in some exposure in VIX and, you know, some short markets like SQQQ, uh, which is the inverse ETF for the Qs. I do think if you have a long-term invested portfolio, you should have some hedges, is my opinion. So I, even though I have some long stocks, I have hedges. I have UVXY. I have some VIX long just in case volatility does increase. That'll hedge against my long positions. Yes. So what about uh, market risks in the immediate future. Do you, uh, are you following any specific news coming out of the U.S., Federal Reserve, perhaps China abroad that uh, may uh, shift your trades in one direction or another? Uh, primarily. So uh, I love to look at fundamental. I like to know everything that's going on, but I love to make my decisions based on what the price is actually doing, right? Because I might have a thesis, like for example, my thesis is that silver is going to be way higher in the next three years than it is now, but that's a thesis, right? But if the prices keep going down, then I'm wrong. So the fact of the matter is, it's, it's a trader's market. You look at your levels, you establish position at your levels, and I think that's the market to uh, currently be in. Because right now, prices don't lie, right? I mean, fundamentals can lie, uh, people on TV could lie, the CEOs could lie, everybody could lie, but price never lies. 
the fact of the matter is the trend uh, has been broken at the moment. And until we get back above today's high again on spiders, uh, we're going to enter a bear market. So today's high is going to be very crucial level to keep an eye out on. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about your positions now. Given your thesis about a bear market entering, uh, uh, entering the um, investor's radar, so to speak, in the foreseeable future, let's talk about how you're getting ready to weather that storm. Great. So um, I have a few positions. I've been looking at real estate stocks. I mean, real estate valuations are definitely through the roof, uh, as everybody is well aware, especially in the United States. So I've been looking at some REITs and some you know, real estate related stocks that have exposure to real estate and looking to short those. So I started establishing positions in- Sorry, just to stock. clarify, Admiral, when you're talking about REITs, that's mostly commercial real estate or are, there, are, are, you, are you including some residential in, uh, real estate as well? I'm including residential as well. Now, that's not to say I'm against the residential market. I think that's still a market with potential, but there are certain stocks that have been on a run like since the last five years that are well due for a pullback. And uh, so I've been establishing shorts in both, uh, you know, both sectors, re re residential and commercial. So one of them is, for example, INVH, it's Invitation Homes. So this is a stock that you know, I shorted a couple of days ago, right around at $39, $40. Um, right now it's down about 38. So it's been going down last few days. I think this one's eventually gonna be around $34, which is probably where I'm gonna get out of my short. So that's one of them. An example of that, again, a monthly short. Right? Look at the last time it got that extended. Look what happened. Snap back, really big crash. Now, again, same thing, multiple you know, months in a row, it's been going up. That's where I try to pick a top and we've got a healthy red bar now forming, which might lead to few further more red bars that are gonna take uh, invitation homes down. So that's just one of them. There's EGP, right? East Group Properties. That's another one that I have a short position in that I short around 173, uh, down at 166 right now. I think this one's gonna be at 156 as well. So those are just certain examples of my exposure on the short side to the real estate sector. But I just want to make it clear to the listeners, these are not investments for me. If they start going against me, I'm not going to watch it go against me, right? As, as the stock keeps going down, I keep bringing my orders down, always locking in profits along the way. So that guarantees that if I'm wrong, my thesis is in, incorrect, these stocks start rallying, I'm still locking in profits on the way down. Yeah, I have to ask you, since we're talking about uh, property stocks, Evergrande, did you ever short that? I did not, I did not, I did not see that one coming. Uh, I'm not too familiar with the Chinese markets. I try to stick to metals, try to stick to U.S. equities and options. Uh, yeah. But again, that would have been a <laughs> really good trade to be in. That would have been a good trade. And you, you, told, you told me offline you're shorting uh, Kathy Woods Fund. Why is that? You don't like tech? Um, I do like tech. Again, I, I do think the valuations are you know across the board crazy. And she does have a lot of exposure to things like Palantir, Tesla in her portfolio, which are also a lot of extended. But then when you look at it technically, uh, this is kind of what I based my thesis on, as you can see here, ARC has been on a run from $35 to $160, right? You've seen a great run. Now for the first time, you're breaking below that key support area of 116, right? And the first time you're getting below, on a weekly chart, below the moving averages as well. So this chart to me, looks like it's ready to pull back at least down to $90. So I'm currently short, uh, I have a position short in ARC Holdings, Shorted it yesterday at $117. Uh, today it's down to $112, and I think this is probably going to be a $90 uh, ETF. It's an interesting point you brought up. You like tech, but you're also short in Kathy Wood's uh, funds. So as a trader, how do, you, how do you rectify that sort of dichotomy there? You like something, yet you're still shorting it. I mean, how do you, is there sort of like an emotional turmoil going on inside you, Emil? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, the, the best way to tell people is like, you know, since I'm a trader more than an investor, is like trade it, don't date it. You know, like you have your like opportunity, that. you have your opportunities, it goes down, you take your profits. You don't need to get, you know, married to a position and hold on to it forever. There's a lot of opportunity right now in the markets for these smaller gains and they add up. Like if you look at the smaller gains through the course of the year, uh, they're going to be performing way better than if I just bought the S and P and held it. Okay, so when you, even though you like something fundamentally, let's say, let's say you, let, let's say you really like Tesla cars, right? You really like the stock. You really like the company. You're a fan of Elon Musk. What, whatever the case may be, but valuations are still overstretched. How do you overcome that thought process? What, what what's in your head there? Right. So valuations definitely overstretched, but as we know, they can continue to get even more overstretched, right? So there's no point That's like right. fighting the market. That's why technically I like levels to be broken or show me some weakness that maybe I can short into or show me some strength that I can buy into. 
because uh, in the end, that's what matters because, you know, there's, it's definitely not a market to be stubborn in. And we've seen that with Tesla. Over the last 10 years, we heard stories about it being bank, going bankrupt, people shorting against it. It just keeps going higher. People keep, people keep losing money. So I think you take trades along the way, right? I mean, I remember I did short Tesla back when it first, you know, went up here at 873 and three times tried to get above it, above that level, couldn't get above it. You shorted it and then it comes back to the 200 MA, right? You buy your position back and now you're staying away from this one that's happening right now. So I think uh, the best way to say it is if I might like something fundamentally, but the price disagrees with my thesis, then you stay out of it, right? I'd rather be out wishing I was in the trade than being in wishing I was out. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of people in the crypto markets there. <laughs> I can sum that up. The sentiment for the crypto is quite well. So uh, you mentioned home, you mentioned uh, property stocks. What about home builders? What about things like Home Depot, um, you know, uh, Rona? What, 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 do you think that the recovery that we're seeing right now is supportive for home builders, construction, renovation? So I think so because the, there's a definitely inflation, the cost of goods and the materials to actually build those properties are going up. That's why the costs are going up. So the cost of the houses and housing prices are going up because of the fact that the materials are more expensive. The cost to actually replace a property if you tear it down and build it back again is way more than keeping the property the same. So I personally think they're all going to move lockstep now with the market as tapering happens. I think everything's going to move with the S&P. And I do think that the home builder ETF, for example, XHB, has for a short term, I think it's hit a top and it's also due for pullback in the 20% range. I know you're a trader, which is why I'm interested to get your take on this next question. Wealth preservation. We're not talking about day trading. We're swing trading here. We're talking about preserving your wealth over the long term. If you had a chunk of money, what would you put that in? Would you put that in real? Would you buy real estate right now to preserve your wealth? Or would you buy precious metals? Would you buy the S&P 500? What, put it in CDs? What would you do? If the, if the goal is capital preservation, then I think uh, silver is definitely the place to be right now. Silver. Uh, okay. because, yeah, because definitely the, the pullback we've recently seen on silver Again, even technically too, this was the level we broke out from back in uh, you know 2020, January 2020. Broke that and we got that short squeeze. Now you're pulling back into that same exact level technically, which has been supported many times before. So I think this is the time where, for me personally, like I sold all of my mutual funds long term. I literally emptied out everything a week ago and sold all my long term uh, investments. But I haven't started buying silver. So like right here, I established a position and I have uh, some room left in case it goes lower to add into my position all the way until this $18 on uh, SLV, right? And I think silver long-term is a good uh, capital preservation. Right now, I think the markets are being, you know, artificially suppressed uh, just because there's a lot of powers that want it to be suppressed because if silver prices go up, the cost of everything, all the industries, right? The materials go up as well, right? So they have to keep it down because it's in their best interest against, there's a lot of vested interest in keeping silver down, but eventually it's going to catch up and, uh, you know, the, the demand is way more than the supply that exists. And yeah. you can't really, you know, just get silver back again. So I do think that it's the time to be contrarian view, start building a position in silver, but keeping a view that it's a five-year window. It's not a trade. This, is, this one's an investment. To keep your three to five-year window, I think silver is going to outperform a lot of assets out there. So just keep it in your account. Don't touch it. Wait for five years. Hibernate for five years, wake up, reap the gains, that kind of thing. Okay. I noticed yep. you didn't bring up fixed income. So bonds, for example, uh, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, whatever, whatever that may be. Even real estate, some people argue is a form of fixed income. You buy the asset, you rent it out, collect rental income. How do you feel about that strategy? So I think as long as it's residential real estate, I'm all for it. Like multifamily apartment complexes, multi-units, right, where you have the exposure. If you're looking to buy, you know, like one or two homes, it's okay. But I would rather be invested in a portfolio of multifamily apartment complexes because that's the trend. What's really going to happen is all these used office spaces that are people are not going to use or go back to work are being converted into multifamily apartment complexes. And people these days, the younger generation, even including myself, I would much rather live in a nice condo where all the facilities are taking care of me, you know, rather than get in a house. So I think that's the way the trend is moving. So if you want exposure into that rental income, from apartments, multifamily condos, that's the place to be. Industrial warehouses, that's the space to be. Storage, that's the space to be. Anything to do with you know, retail or office spaces, like I think you stay far, far away from them. Finally, uh, Amo, are you still launching a hedge fund? Tell us about your hedging strategies. Sure. So I'm definitely still working on it. There's a lot of paperwork and compliance stuff to go for. You know, there's conflicts between the education side, but I'm still working on that process. Uh, but I still debate sometimes with myself. I'm like, 
you know, right now I've got a good enough lifestyle that I could travel and do it from anywhere. Do I really want to buy myself a job? As I've been debating that topic a lot, but it's coming along. But my hedging strategy is a trading strategy. So I will always at any given time, even though I'm bearish on the market, I will have some longs. I will have some shorts. So usually I'm diversified and I'm looking for stocks that, that don't resemble the market's chart that kind of on their own page. Mm. Right. So I have a mix of longs and shorts. I keep some silver. I sometimes might get into some bonds using TLT ETF. So I try to hedge my exposure that way and not really putting in more than, you know, two, three percent in any given stock of my account. That still leaves a lot of chunk of cash left in case I want to add into my positions. So you diversify by buying things that are uncorrelated with your core positions, if I understand correctly. That's your that's no, one of your no, strategies. Correct. You don't pick things that specifically move in the opposite direction. Like let's say you buy a tech stock and you know something else has a history of moving the other way. You don't, you wouldn't buy that? Um, not really. And it, even if I do, like for me, I consider them trades uh, rather than investments. So I would have targets on every investment that I make. Every trade I that I make will have a target and will also have an exit point in case my thesis is wrong. I'm never going to be one of those investors that you know, you're going to hear about taking massive losses because I'm very disciplined in that regard. I will have an exit point. I'm like, okay, if this point breaks, I was wrong. And you have to be okay with admitting that you were wrong and getting out when price is going against you. And then you can always get back in. You can reevaluate your thesis and get back in. So I think having exposure between longs and shorts, small caps and big caps in different sectors like real estate, then you have tech with ARC holdings. You have different exposure, you will be you know, diversified. Interesting. All right, Hamo. Excellent thoughts. Thank you for your update today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Always great chatting with you. Always great chatting with you too. And thank you for watching Kiko News. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at DavidLid underscore TV.